Joining me now from the Jeffries Industrials Conference is Chris Kubasic. He's the CEO of L3 Harris Technologies. It's so great to be sitting with you. Thanks for joining me. Anytime. It's good to see you, Morgan. So you're fresh off stage giving your presentation to investors. Your message? Oh, messages are trusted disruptor strategy is working. It's been five years since L3 and Harris merged. Uh, we're disrupting the market. Uh, we're unique and different in that uh, we go to market either as a prime, a merchant supplier, or a sub based on our capabilities, probability to win, and um, the business case. So uh, we've been very successful in growing in space, in growing in communications. And uh, just last week, we won the Next Gen, next gen Jammer for the uh, U.S. Navy, which will give uh, you know, the F-18s the capability to fly into uh, adversaries' uh, uh, space uh, while jamming their, uh, their radars. So we're very excited about that. Yeah, and I'm going to jump right into that with you because that was an award four years in the making. It was protested after it was awarded back in 2020, it got tied up in litigation. Um, so what, what does this mean to now have this contract across the finish line? What does it mean for L3 Harris? Oh, it, it, it aligns perfectly with our strategy. Uh, we're focused on communications. We're low, focused on electronic warfare. We're platform agnostic. So this gives us a multi-billion dollar capability. What I also like is the U.S. Navy for the initial contract is cost reimbursable. It's development. I think that's the right contracting vehicle as we have iterations and change. And then subsequently, we'll go into fixed price production, um, which, which is the way that the, the acquisition process is supposed to work. There could be export uh, potential down the road to the Five Eyes countries. So it's uh, probably a program that would have traditionally gone to one of the major primes. But as we've uh, put this company together and tried to disrupt things, it's a big win for us. You talk about how it's the acquisition process is supposed to work. What needs to change with the acquisition process, if anything? And I ask that knowing that there's not a week that goes by that I don't speak to, for example, a defense tech startup uh, founder who says things need to change. We're trying to get in there and disrupt things and, and, and make more with less. Absolutely. I, I think the one thing we don't need is another study on acquisition reform. There are hundreds that have been done over the last several decades. I think uh, the Department of Defense is, is interested and somewhat infatuated with these startups, these new companies, these non-traditional commercial companies as they're referred to. And, and I fully support that. The rest of us are viewed as traditional defense contractors. We have a lot of regulation. We have a lot of oversight. And I think my vision would be for the entire defense industrial base to be viewed commercially over the next decade. So let's take the goodness that is happening with these new entrants and let's apply that to the rest of the defense industrial base. Let's have more products that are deemed commercial, put out an RFP, get the proposals, pick the winner and move on. So we need more speed, we need more agility. And I think uh, migrating towards a commercial defense industrial base to quote the Department of Defense is the right answer and the right vision. So let's let's move forward. I'm fully behind it, fully supportive, and uh, we're going to do everything we can to get that to be the uh, the future. In fact, 20% of our revenue comes from the commercial business model, which is why we have the highest margins in the defense industry. Anyway, let's do more and more of that. It's interesting to hear you say that, and you talk about the fact that L3 Harris has this trusted disruptor tag or approach to how you how you do business in this industry. How do you see the competitive landscape evolving here as you do see these new defense tech entrants come in? And, and I think about even just recently, the first Titan vehicles being delivered, which is Palantir is the prime for that, but L3 Harris contributed. Absolutely. We've been embracing uh, the new entrants. We started several years ago on your show when we rolled out and announced that we were going to be the uh, exclusive uh, strategic investor in Shield Capital. As of today, we have 2 to 8% ownership in about 40 high-tech companies focused on autonomy, AI, cyber, uh, and space. And the, the, the vision, which is working, is to pull those technologies into our solutions. Right? I doubt we'll ever buy one of these companies. We want to use their technology. It's a form of accelerating R&D. So we're seeing that. You mentioned Palantir. Perfect example. We're a subcontractor to Palantir. They won. We thought it was the best probability win for the combined team to let them be the prime and then the business case closes. So we're working collaboratively with them. I think that's unique, I think that's different. And when we talk about our 2026 financial framework of 23 billion of revenue, 16% margins, and 2.8 billion of free cash, it's that type of approach that's gonna get us there.
Mm. And of course, that's the next strategy that you've laid out. After you closed the acquisition of Aerojet Rocketdyne last year, you also did put uh, a halt to more M&A activity, at least in the foreseeable future. So the fact that you are investing in these different companies, some of which I believe is happening through Shield Capital, um, how does that ownership model continue to evolve over the years as those capabilities take shape? Yeah, I, I think there'll be more and more opportunities to invest. As a venture capital, there will be some sort of monetization for these, which will be somewhat outside our control. We may be a board observer or have a board seat, but you know that will get us our money back or two times or three times or four times. We'll have that money to reinvest into more and more small businesses. And I think it's uh, morphing more towards that commercial market, higher margins, more cash, more speed, and uh, more innovation. And I think it's a differentiator uh, we're on the forefront, and it seems to be working. So with Next, cost-cutting, increasing operational efficiencies, where are you in that process? Oh, great question. We rolled that out back in December, the same time we did the 2026 uh, financial framework. We set a goal of a billion dollars of uh, cost takeout and transformation of the company by 2026. We are ahead of schedule, I would think, at our next uh, earnings call or maybe in the end of the year. We will increase the billion dollars, and we may get there before 2026. So we're taking uh, difficult decisions, it involves headcount, involves supply chain, involves facilities, and uh, you're seeing it in our financial results. Last quarter, our, our margins were up 80 basis points. Uh, we have a pretty good pathway and a pretty good visibility to 16%. They're already industry-leading margins by a, by a bunch, and they're going to get larger, and this is how we're going to transform the company. It's more than just taking the cost out. It's focusing on digital engineering. It's focusing on innovation, and it's really setting this up uh, for the future. And I think that begs the question, when we talk about some of these next-gen capabilities and some of these new technologies, generative AI, for example, autonomy, whether it's on the battlefield where there's an increasing focus on that ability or on the factory floor, how are you adopting it? Oh, we're absolutely adopting AI. We're using it in a lot of our uh, actual administrative systems, something as simple as accounts payable and payroll and HR, right, to, to, to eliminate uh, waste and be uh, streamlined. Uh, the operations. On the factory floor, we're using more and more robotics and technology. A lot of what we're doing at Aerojet and the new factory that we'll be breaking ground on shortly is, is almost all automated. And then we're using the digital, digital engineering, you know, for our testing and our, our simulation. You know, one thing we, we're doing differently uh, is really just getting the workforce energized and excited. We rolled out our first ever uh, disruptor challenge. So we, we, we put out a critical problem for our customer. I'll just say it deals with uh, drones. And as of today, we have 76 different L3 Harris teams that have formed to try to solve this problem. And they submit a five minute video. Our team reviews it. We'll go down to like the Sweet 16 or the Elite, Elite Eight. And then they'll do a three week sprint. And we hope to come up with a cool, creative solution We'll take that to the customer and see how we get this into the battlefield. This particular one deals with Ukraine. So there's a lot of energy, a lot of excitement. It's a unique way of doing things. You don't need a multi-year, multi-billion R&D project. You don't have to wait for a contract. Um, the teams are super excited. We literally have hundreds of people, if not a thousand, that have formed these teams on their own to try to win these challenges. There'll be a little financial incentive, but. They're more driven by the mission hmm. and uh, can't wait to see some of these videos and see what comes of it. So I think we'll do two or three a year. It's super exciting. Okay. So the takeaway here, it sounds like you're forging further into the drone business and we know there's so much focus there right now and a lot of demand there from a defense standpoint. Absolutely. This particular case deals more with the resilient communications, okay. making sure that, that the drones get to their, their targets, not our drones, but it's really all about communications, jamming, lack of jamming. So. We'll see what comes of it, but we're super excited. So your outlook for defense spending, we're coming up against the end of fiscal 2024 here. Uh, clock is ticking for lawmakers to come up with a new budget for fiscal 2025 at the end of the month. Does it happen? What does that mean for defense spending at a time where there seems to be expectation that we have top line growth that's flat? Correct. We, uh, we, unfortunately, I don't foresee a scenario where we'll have a defense budget by uh, October 1. So we'll have a continuing resolution. I think for the uh, 18th time in 19 years, it's crazy. one of these days, one of these days, uh, hopefully we'll have a defense budget at the beginning of the year. Everybody says it, but it never, never gets done. I think if you look at the base budget and what the president request was for 25 relative to 24, 
it's uh, capped at 1%. It's a 1% increase. There's absolutely bipartisan support to increase the uh, defense budget and maybe even get supplementals. So I would envision, you know, that that number will grow from the 850 billion, probably closer to 900 billion. It needs to cover the cost of inflation. And then ultimately, you know, it comes down to the threats. We all know there's election coming up. I'm sure you have an election question. Of course. But, you know, you go back 80 years, there is no correlation to the defense budget and who's in the White House, who's running the Senate and who's running of the House of Reps. It's always tied to the threats. And when you look around the world, you know better than I, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, not a good situation. And those countries are collaborating more than anyone ever expected to, which just makes the threat environment very, very uh, dangerous. And we need an, uh, a strong uh, defense uh, industrial base and national security posture. How would you characterize this level of risk from a geopolitical standpoint in the world right now? I think it's the highest that it's it's been in, in decades, unfortunately. And you know, we're just talking about uh, we haven't even thrown in the the non-state actors, right? There's there's those you know we still have those in in addition uh, to the states that, that that I mentioned. So we need to deter, uh, and I think that strategy makes sense. You know, a recent meeting in the Pentagon that's part of our national defense strategy. You need a strong industrial base. You need strong capabilities. It's all about positioning for the future of warfare. That's why we've taken a portfolio approach, and uh, I'm happy with the portfolio we have and how we can help the uh, Department of Defense deter our uh, adversaries. Mm. So I am going to ask the election question. So this was back on August 9th. Morgan Stanley writes, the November election presents somewhat of a wild card in our view, as conventions around relative political party support for defense spending may be coming undone. Now, I realize a lot has changed even just in the last month in terms of this presidential race. But two months out from an outcome, do you think that's true? Do you think some of the norms that we've seen along political lines has, has shifted? No, I think uh, you know people say what they need to get elected. And then once you get in office, you look at the threats, you do what's in the best interest of protecting the freedoms of the nation. And you know, unfortunately, that means more and more money for, for defense. And, um, you know, that's that's how I see this uh, playing out over the months ahead. And again, you know, every four years we have an election. I know we go through this. And it's it's not I don't want to say it's not a big deal. We know how this works. There's an election. There's a change of government. There isn't a change of government. You look at the threats, you pass the budget and we continue forward. So I think it's business as usual. We've told the team, you know, just focus on meeting your commitments and delivering to your customer. There's things you can control. There's things you can't control. Vote for whoever you want and let's get back to business and stay focused on the mission. Of course, you have a big book, a big and growing book of international business as well, and we're seeing defense dollars grow abroad too. So how does that play out? Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a positive. We're uh, over 20% of our revenue comes from uh, international customers, allies and such, which I think is one of the larger uh, percentages relative to the uh, traditional primes. So Europe has been a huge market. Uh, opportunity with NATO. Uh, again, when you see the focus on resilient communications, we're looking at opportunities all over Europe, which historically has not been a, a huge market for U.S. defense uh, companies. Obviously, the Far East and Middle East continue to be uh, great opportunities. We have ISR capabilities. We have resilient comms, software-defined radios, night vision goggles, obviously munitions going through the primes. So I think we're well positioned for growth internationally, and we're, we're seeing it. Mm. Finally, I have to ask you a space question, okay. because as soon as tomorrow we see Starliner, which is a Boeing vehicle, coming back to Earth empty without its astronauts from the International Space Station, we know NASA made the decision to have SpaceX step in and, and bring those astronauts back after this test flight in February. The propulsion system, Aerojet Rocketdyne, makes it, which is an L3 Harris company. Your response? Yeah, I, I will say uh, I'm going to ultimately defer to NASA and, and Boeing relative to the specifics. I think uh, both have publicly said we've been working collaboratively and uh, very supportive. Uh, deliveries were made four or five years ago, and they have to be used within the uh, certain specs uh, relative to how they're designed. But it's, uh, it's a team effort. Everybody's focused on learning from this and, and what we can do better. But uh, no... Um, Nothing but positive accolades for the uh, for the team and and how we're working to help solve this problem. An Aerojet team is actively involved in this process. Absolutely, Chris Kubasek. 
L3Harris CEO. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you.